Hey everybody, it's Jay Woods here with something quite a bit different. There's a lot of backstory behind this, so I figured I'd do my best to cover everything in three bullet points. Let's see what we can do with those. One, 2016 was an insane year. We moved to the West Coast, I worked an additional full-time job at Twitch in addition to this channel, and at the very end of the year I left to focus on my own projects. I did a long write-up about this year that you can read in the description if you're interested in all the fine details, but in general things changed a lot for me. Two, where's the top 10 Nintendo games of 2016? For the last few years, I've run this top 10 consistently, but to be completely honest, this year was tough. Not just for Nintendo, who essentially pulled out a production for the Wii U, but for myself, and it became really hard for me to find the free time to play video games when working the two full-time jobs at the same time. These right here were the Nintendo games I was able to play this year, and then these are the Nintendo games that I was able to finish or at least substantially play. This will change in 2017 now that I'm back down to just content creation, but I didn't want to try and make a top Nintendo games video when I haven't been able to play all the major releases this year, even in a lighter year. And finally, three. Why the heck board games? To be honest, board and tabletop gaming has always been a huge passion of mine. It's a big reason why my first videos are about the Pokemon trading card game. I've learned that amazing and unique board game worlds are being created every single year, and in my opinion, 2016 was an amazing one. San Francisco introduced me to a huge community of tabletop games and game designers, and it brought me back to a passion that I had shelved a few years ago, designing my own tabletop game. I hope someday I can share this project with you guys, but for today, I want to share some of my favorite board gaming experiences from this past year. As for why this video has nothing to do with Nintendo, uh, every once in a while it's refreshing to talk about something outside of Nintendo that I'm passionate about. We did that Sega Genesis video that one time and nobody seemed to get too upset. Oh my god, that was four years ago? Number 10. Codenames, pictures. Of all the games on today's list, this one will probably have the highest chance of sticking no matter what kind of group you have together. The original codenames exploded onto the scene last year to the point where you can now find it in local stores like Target everywhere, and it's great. One spymaster on each team creates one-word clues to try and get the rest of the team to guess secretly hidden agents in your color, hoping that you don't accidentally lead them to your opponent's spies, or even worse, the assassin, which immediately loses the game for your team. The new pictures variant adds absurd images instead of words, while simultaneously making the board smaller. The pictures make stringing clues together a little trickier, and the smaller board makes it easier to lead someone into the game-ending assassin. It's a great variant for an already great party game, and I actually enjoyed this one a little bit more than the original. Number 9. Sushi Go Party. The original Sushi Go was my go-to game to teach people how to do a draft-style game. Sushi Go Party upgrades the original in every single way. In the original, you pick and pass hands of adorable sushi cards to score points at the end of each round, using the same setup each time. But in Party, you get a big box with dozens of selections that change, giving you a ton of variety with every single game, with different sushi and different menu changers. The new board not only makes it easy for every single player to learn your specific game's cards right there in the center, but the sushi conveyor belt around the outside allows you to track score without having to use a paper and pen. It's bigger, better, still under $20, and was definitely my favorite family game of the year. Number 8. Time Stories, A Prophecy of Dragons. Time Stories is a really unique campaign for up to four players, sending agents to different places in history and alternative timelines to repair temporal faults. It kind of gives off that Assassin's creed vibe, where you assume the lives of other characters and live through them in a different time period. While I've had a mix of fun and occasional frustration going through the first couple episodes, the new fantasy-themed Prophecy of Dragons added my favorite episode yet, with gorgeous art, a system that felt a lot more fun to explore, and some awesome twists that I can't talk about because they would be a huge spoiler. I'm a sucker for time travel, and Prophecy of Dragons felt like the episode where things really started getting serious. I can't wait to see where the story goes next. Number 7 Seven Wonders Duel God, I love drafting games. I swear, you could give me a bag of differently colored rocks and I'd draft them if you told me they had different stats. Enter Seven Wonders Duel and its 2016 expansion Pantheon, a two-player game all about drafting rocks. And other resources so that you can build the most impressive new civilization. Seven Wonders Duel is smart and dense and it's a shock that so much game is tucked within this tiny box. Between three rounds of drafting and various open-faced setups, you'll construct buildings, battle over multiple win conditions of glory, science, and military, and in the expansion, even race to appease the powerful gods themselves. 
It's a perfect two-player setting with a great mix of luck and skill. Games are quick, and it's hard to finish a game without immediately jumping into a new one to see what strategy you can do differently this time. Number 6. Scythe. Stonemaier Games' Scythe was one of the most hyped Kickstarter board games of all time, equal parts because of their solid track record as well as the game's downright gorgeous steampunk art style. While it might have been impossible for Scythe to ever be as big as its own hype train, I can't deny that it's been a ton of fun. It's a Euro-style game set in, well, fictional Europe, where different factions battle to claim awards, build an empire, and even build mechs for combat. The game gives you a ton of different paths to victory, powered by really unique player sheets that allow you to move pieces locked into the cardboard in order to activate upgrades. Players compete to be the first to win six of many different achievements, and the sheer number of pieces and options have made it a game that I really want to keep exploring. Heck, it even has its own separate deck and rules to play a solo game against AI. There's a bit of everything here. Number 5 Star Wars Rebellion it's Star Wars in a box, with over 150 miniatures, big cards, small cards, character stands, and a massive set of rules. It's a classic battle of the Empire versus the Rebellion, as the more military powerful Empire tries to snuff out the Rebellion by finding their hidden base. It's deep, interactive, and dripping with Star Wars lore. While repetitive dice-based combat and up to four plus hours for a single game might turn some away, if you love thematic strategy in Star Wars, this is about as good as it gets. Number 4 New Angeles I'm a huge fan of Netrunner and the Android universe. I also like negotiation games like Dead of Winter and Secret Hitler. New Angeles is some kind of crazy corporate combination of both, where players take control of an evil super corporation in a race to out-earn their opponents. Every player gets a random hidden rival card, and all you have to do is outscore your rival to win. So more often than not, there are multiple winners and multiple losers every game. But one of the cards is the villainous Federalist, who wants the players to make bad decisions for the city, destroy the city, and let the government take over. It's an absurdly complicated game, but if you get a good group that's interested in it, it's also incredibly thematic. The game encourages you to be greedy, but not so greedy that you'll blow up the city. There's an insane amount of responsibilities, like investments, meeting the city's demands, cleaning the city of threats, dealing with random events, and the main meat of the game, proposing and making counteroffers in a heated boardroom battle for assets. You want to control the android workforce, but you can't make the humans too angry. It's cooperative, but you're all trying to stab each other in the back. It's definitely not for everyone, but man, is it tense and interactive once you get the full experience going. Number 3 Inish Inish, I think that's how you pronounce it, I read it on the internet in a comment once, is a beautiful game all about drafting and area control. It's a game built on and surrounded in Celtic lore, with some of the biggest cards I've ever played with. I got big hands, and I really hate handling mini cards, so this was a pleasant change. Players draft a small pile of a dozen or so available actions, and then battle to expand their clan and control one of three different area control win conditions, or it's sometimes more than one if you're locked into a tie. In addition to your regular green cards, you get area-specific yellow cards if you own a single piece of the game's randomly generated lands. And there's also a massive deck of red epic cards that can be summoned through effects as well. The drafting pile is small, and always has one randomly removed card. So skilled players can predict upcoming actions with almost perfect accuracy, but not quite. The fine details of this puzzle come down to when and how you need to play your hand out. It's a tight, strategic, pretty, and easy-to-follow game. Can't ask for more, and it really is wonderful. Number 2 Junk Art This is the only dexterity game on this year's list, but man, it is now one of my favorite dexterity games of all time. Think like Jenga, where you're hoping to build and balance towers, but with a mixed selection of funky shapes and colors instead of just blocks. It's a game about building towers, but what really made it a game changer for my friends and family is the world tour mechanic. You play a series of mini-games, every time changing the way that you need to build your tower. Sometimes it's just building the tallest tower. Sometimes it's surviving longer than your opponents before your tower falls. Sometimes you control which pieces your opponent gets when you try and give them garbage. Or sometimes it's a speed run. Sometimes you're physically standing up and moving to a new partially built tower. Every city is a new game mode. It's a wonderful marriage of physical skill and actual strategy. It's fun for all ages, and I haven't played anything else quite like it before. Number 1! Terraforming Mars I've looked at and rearranged this list many times, and even to this point, I can't decide how Terraforming Mars keeps finding the top spot. It's super experimental, the component quality is kinda weak, 
and the art on the cards is a weird mix of illustrations and stock art. It wasn't in a very massive print run, which also makes it really expensive to get a hold of right now. So why put this tacky game in the number one spot? I guess it's because of the only thing that really matters. I had the most fun playing it this year. It's an economy-driven game where you work as a corporation to make Mars survivable by increasing the oxygen, creating water sources, and making the temperature rise enough where humans could live on it. There's a ton of themed corporation cards making every game feel completely different because of all kinds of different starting strengths. Maybe you're a credit company that has a lot of money, or a mining company that really wants to turn over the earth. It changes every time. Players use these salary cards and economy cubes to simultaneously track how many resources they get each turn, as well as how much of each raw resource that they currently own. The main core of the game comes from 200 unique cards, which can be bought, drawn, or drafted depending on the various game modes that you're playing. If there's anything this game offers, it's variety. Every single game, I feel like I'm building the planet in a completely different way. There's a race to get all kinds of achievements first for the most grand total of points, and finding the best route to victory has been my favorite puzzle of this year. I don't normally like straight economy builders that much, and I don't normally like games of mediocre art, but for some reason I loved pushing cubes around, activating systems, and aggressively trying to map Damon my way into making this darn planet livable. Ultimately, my favorite thing about board games is that they bring people together. One of the reasons I love Nintendo so much is that they never fully abandon same-room multiplayer play. In a world of massively popular online gaming, it's always refreshing and fun to bring a group of people to the same table and interact with an infinite amount of worlds and game systems. I do hope someday that I can talk about my own board game with you guys. When we get far enough into playtesting, maybe I'll even share a little bit of the development process here in this channel. But until then, thank you so much for checking out this video about something a little different. I'll always have more Nintendo stories to share, but every once in a while, it really is fun sharing my thoughts on other things that I love just as much. Whatever it is, I'll see you guys next time with some more gaming content.